resurgence of sub-Saharan African markets and the huge investment potential has been in part due to the forged partnership between this region and the BRIC nations. Uh, we have the BRICs, they have shown the way. Yeah. You can take your own control, control your own destiny. Don't let people who are failing, who have been failing anyway, to be found to tell you what to do. You know, um, uh, but there are very few, there are not that many voices that ability to point out this is but it's happening. When I think about Africa, I think about the immense opportunity and uh, just the amount of potential development and the amount of potential that uh, both in Kenya, within East Africa, and as a continent as, all, as a whole um, has the ability to become and evolve. And I think the keys to unlocking that success are education, entrepreneurship, and investment. Well, not recipient That's the question. The question is, uh, should be rephrased. The other way. Are uh, they ready to do this? The, the, the first thing I think uh, the Africans should get the answer. We should do our own thing. And that's why, you see, what, what do those people They did their own thing and forgot those people. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The minute you start waiting for approval, you mess up. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, that's why, well, that's what your Kenya did. Uh, so stop waiting for approval from them. We do, we, do, we do it our own and then we yes. see. Yes. And when they, once you do your own thing and it works, then they'll come. But as long as you are begging them, they'll continue insulting you. Hmm? So it is not for that way to try to do this with those people. No. Leave them. But let us do it on our own. We let's, provide our own fix, in market. Let's in fix our own uh, thing here. We, and we can fix our own. Yes. And then they'll come anyway. You know, they will get interested in Because things. it is in their interest to find out why they are doing, they are doing good. Yeah, why they are doing good. Because they would like to uh, they would like to continue being the ones in control. So if they are not in control, then why? African countries that can command enough economic clout in the international system, then the world will listen. The, the United Nations member state will listen and see. Because it's, it's not uh, possible to, to attain, you have to, to have clout in the international system. And economically, it, it really helps if you have economic clout. And um, we know that the United Nations is funded by its member states. And unfortunately, most of the African states are deep in debt. So even if they make um, contributions to run the United Nations, they may not uh, command a big quarter of, of what is used to run the international system. So if we can get an African country that is able to uh, command a, a big quarter or a substantive quarter in the international system, making um, donations to the United Nations, then, then the international system and other member countries will listen. You know what? This may not be a popular thing to say, but I'll say it anyway. Is there so much talent on this continent? And I guess, and there's, there are a lot of financial resources on this continent too. And I think it's just a need for young people to start thinking creatively and entrepreneurially in looking at how you can begin to develop industries within this continent. Um, because you, you have the talent, you have the expertise, you have the skills. So why is it that you always need somebody else to come help you do it? You know, why is it you can't, just like the alumni I was telling you about, they package their own coffee and sell it. You know, why are you, why don't, and, and there are people here who are packaging yogurt, juices, you know, I, I read the labels, I buy candy, you know, to make sure that I'm getting and, and reinforcing and, and supporting the industry that's here locally. Sometimes it costs a little bit more 
you know, that I don't understand either, how imported products can cost less than existing products. So, I, 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 I than local products. So, I, I guess there's still some things that need to happen. You know, electricity costs are going to have to go down. And I think the, the Kenyan government is working on that with the wind uh, energy in Turkana and the thermal energy. Um, and so I think as, as some of the overhead costs begin to come down. Text. In the case of Kenya, we've indicated that the commercial borrowing should, uh, the priority of this lending should be for the development of Kenya's domestic renewable energy capacity. Why is this so important? If we look at 2011, for instance, all the problems that the country faced uh, on its uh, on its uh, on the trade side was linked were in large part due to the fact that uh, Kenya significantly had to increase its imports of oil because of the drought mm -hmm. and the fact that the country's hydropower capacity had been severely reduced. As a result, in 2011, oil imports represented about 30 percent of the country's total oil imports. They represented about 80% of export revenues and almost accounted for the current account deficit in total. So this means that if Kenya could invest in the development of its domestic renewable energies, it could reduce its dependence on oil imports. And when we're seeing that droughts are becoming increasingly frequent in Kenya, unfortunately, because of climate change, these investments in domestic renewable energies take on essential meaning. And if Kenya were able to harness all its potential in terms of domestic renewable energy, it might be in a position simply to get rid of that structural current account deficit problem. Sub-Saharan Africa's low economic growth has in part been blamed on the dependence on exportation of agricultural raw materials and unprocessed minerals to the West. This is because, as history goes, the colonial governments had no intention to build industries. The Northwestern population surpassed the demand for these raw materials and Sub-Saharan Africa provided the best opportunity to grab them. Our resources, we have to, to take um, charge and be at the forefront as far as controlling oil resources is concerned. Like oil money, diamond money, you know, minerals in Africa. We have really got to take charge. We are not poor, are we? We are not poor. We are not poor at all. We have got lots of resources and the resources that the world may or could not or cannot rather do without, like um, coal tan. The, we all are using culture in our phones, in our laptops. So really, we are not poor. But one thing that we must challenge ourselves as Africans is that we need to start adding value to our raw materials, to our natural resources. Because what happens is that we ship out our raw materials, get it back when, it has, when value has been added to it, and we pay lots of money um, to, to, have, to have those very value added um, materials and uh, products, yet originally they came from this continent. So we have to have a paradigm shift as far as our view and our participation in the international political economy is concerned. So Africa is in that struggle. And uh, the countries that have been able to come out of it, or to try and come out, not very, not very many in Africa, because Brazil and Argentina appear to have come out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. China is doing very well on China. Um, the, the number two economy in the world. Yeah. And then uh, Brazil number five. Yeah, the number five. The part of the BRICS. Yeah. And the BRICS is another yeah. block that is. Uh, yeah. And what you what is common about them, in my analysis, is that they have all agreed in their own individual way that you get your political behavior straight, control your own domestic decision. Each of them, they don't allow anyone else to guide them okay. on what to do. Or guide them among the, any any influence yeah, among yeah, themselves. You know, they say, you know, these are our problems. We shall deal with it our way. Because the more, the more 
of a dependency culture that we create, the less powerful we look, the more inferior we become as African states. With all these challenges, industries have still managed to spring up in Africa, and there is need to come up with more processing industries that will eventually bar the exportation of raw materials to foreign business partners. leadership entirely from an ethnic lens, period. You and me may not, but the bulk of the masses who vote look at it that way. Okay? So it doesn't matter how visionary, how intellectual, how good a record somebody competing for leadership has. Majority of Kenyans will still vote for somebody on the basis of ethnic value. So the first thing we have to defeat if you're going to be a traditional leader is the ethnicity. And this is the good news is defeat, de defeating ethnicity is a possibility. Yeah. Okay? When you have leaders that can promote nationalism better than ethnicity, ethnicity is very advantageous for short sighted leaders because it gives you a base, what they call a base of political power. That first of all, you must have a beginning check. Yeah. That the whole of my tribe is, is behind me. Now that gives me, you know, the wherewithal to compete on a national platform. Okay? But. If you can find a leadership, a leadership that promotes nationalism at the expense of ethnicity, that is one of the I'll give you two examples. At independence, I wasn't around, but I read this in history books. Nationalism in Kenya was so high that nobody thought about ethnic considerations. In Nakuru, for example, a region dominated by the Kikuyu and the Kalenjin, the person who was elected the member of parliament was a Chimoneko, a Luo. In Nairobi's Embakasi estate, Sorry, Kamkunji estate. The person who was elected the, the member of parliament was Tom Boyer, a Luo. Nationalism was so high that nobody didn't co consider that these were Luos and we are Kikus that we are voting for him. But look at it 40 years down the drain. Well, where do you go? Ethnic arithmetic determines who becomes the member of parliament of a given area. Now, having said that, how do you defeat this? This can be replaced, for example, by emphasizing class relations as opposed to ethnic relations. For example, when teachers fight for their rights, they look at their struggle as the struggle for teachers' rights, and you've seen that recently. They don't care whether they're Gikuyu cool teachers or Luo teachers, whether they're Luya teachers or Kisi teachers, whether they're Kamba teachers or Kalenjin teachers. They are so united in their quest for achieving better terms for teachers. When doctors fight for their rights, they look at themselves as doctors. So if you can come up with a leadership that promotes class interests as opposed to ethnic interests, that can be one way of defeating ethnicity. And I would urge all African leaders to read a book that Nyerere wrote. It is called The Philosophy of Nyerere. So that people understand why Tanzania has the most unified sense of nationhood in the whole of the African yeah. continent. Ethnicity almost doesn't exist. If all African leaders can be schooled, internalize, and appreciate that particular philosophy and implement it in their own regions, we will have defeated ethnicity. Step one. After you defeat ethnicity, then that now gives you the possibility of electing a visionary leadership. Once you have a visionary leadership across the anti African continent, then now you have the chance to think about more challenging things economy, globalization, international relations, and global competitiveness. That is only achieved by once you have a national leadership. But so long as you're still fighting ethnic wars in every country around Africa, you are still very far from reaching that destination of being competitive.